welcome to another edition of the eSpot with Camille. The eSpot is your location for the latest in entertainment, beauty, and design from the people who make it. Thanks for joining. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the eSpot with Camille. I am your host, Camille Cower, and today is my dream guest because she not only is a designer, but I've watched her on TV for decades, like for decades, and never thought that I would get the chance to not only interview her once, but twice. And I got the chance because I use my child as bait. Um, I got a little sneak peek of her latest project, which I cannot wait for her to share more about. Without any further ado, here is Jennifer Farrell from Calibu. Hi, Camille. Hi, I'm so excited to chat with you again, because Last time I chat with you, it was just a quick little virtual high point market because everything was shut down, but now everything's back open. You're back working. You're back doing all the hosting of dreams. Um, like I was about to say the wrong name, but uh, I'll let you share it because you have so many different shows that you're working on that I'm thinking about the shows you've already done with OWN and when you were on The View and because I was watching Sherry Shepard today. And I was like, oh my gosh, I remember when she was on The View with Sherry Shepard. So again... Oh, no. Just give the people a little rundown of what you're doing because you're so busy and so amazing at what you do. Well, that was quite an introduction, and thank you. Uh, and yeah, so let's see. I'm hosting um, Find Me a Beach House, and I'm hosting. Um, what's the other one? Let's see. Find Me a Beach House. Most and amazing home. Even, even I don't know. So yeah, there you go. I'm like, uh, uh, but, I'm dyslexic, so I'm like, I don't want to say it in the wrong order because all I know is most amazing fits because you're going into these super million dollars, not just millions, but billions almost dollars homes and just I mean, giving us all a little sneak peek into the life of the rich and famous. It's kind of crazy because some of the homes that we go into on most amazing homes are bonkers. Uh, we did an episode at The One, which is that mega mansion in Beverly, uh, in, excuse me, in Bel Air that just sold for $140 million. It's like the largest house in America. It's 105,000 square feet. It's crazy. So I do get to go in some pretty wackadoo projects uh, on that show. And then finally, a beach house is great because I get to, you know, I'm taking buyers around to beach houses and, you know, I get to walk in the sand. And so those are, they're both really, really fun shows. Our, like I was mentioning earlier about some of your previous work where you were doing more helping homeowners on a budget or even working at big lots and to now go to into these $150 million homes. Oh my, what were some of the different fixtures or just the different things inside of their homes that just really blew you away? Well, I will say that uh, I've definitely learned that money does not dictate taste. And that's something that I've always thought um, but over the last 20 years or no, yeah, 20 years of being on all sorts of different shows where some, as you said, I, you know, designing and hosting on shows where, you know, I take a, a wagon wheel and turn it into a coffee table. And then other shows, I get to go into these hundred million dollar mega mansions. And yet style is not about money. Now, obviously it's easier to buy pretty things with a lot of money, but uh, creativity and vision are more important than anything. And so that's where getting to have the experience of working on really tight budgets for some of these shows and then seeing what limitless budgets are, you can still have style on a super tight budget. It's really about your point of view, your vision, and being creative in the implementation. You brought it up for those of us who do have to buy luxury on a dime, <laughs> or um, what is the saying? Have a have champagne taste, but a beer budget. What mm -hmm. are some of your best tips for finding, I guess, those steals out there? Well, we are in an interesting era where there are a lot of knockoffs, and so you've got designs that are exquisite and beautiful and wonderfully made, and then very quickly you'll see those get knocked off uh, by manufacturers that maybe aren't using the same level of quality materials. I think that when you're shopping on a budget, um, look for creative sources. And so don't necessarily buy something that is the cheapest 
products, try to buy something that is um, still decently made, and especially if it's something that you're going to want to have for a long time, and look for creative resources to get that done. Um, you know, for example, and I, I love Restoration Hardware, I love RH Modern, um, but we do know that they have outlets. And so, you know, you can find that beautiful table for a third the price that you would pay retail. It just may take you some time and creativity. And then I like to, if I'm finding one piece that's more expensive and then I'm trying to fill everything out on a budget, that's where the, like the secondary pieces, the ancillary pieces, those are the ones where, you know, I've, I've mixed a lot of Ikea upholstered dining chairs with restoration hardware dining tables. And it's a great way to have an $80 chair and a table that's thousands of dollars that you get on sale at the outlet. Um, and, you know, the, the price point, all of a sudden, you're in a really comfortable zone when you're on a budget, but it's about mixing those materials in a really thoughtful way. And Ikea, I have to say, they've had some dining chairs that I absolutely loved in the years. So it's, it's really about taking your time to source things and be open to sourcing maybe in a different way than it just going into a showroom and, and blowing the big budget. I'm glad you brought that up about Ikea because... Um, there's a huge Ikea, not that close to me. It's about three hours away. But I grew up, um, I didn't move to America until I was about 14. And so Scandinavian furniture is what I had. Like I had the big white wardrobes and they lasted from trip to trip, military brats. So they lasted from trip to trip to trip all the way over to America. And until I was, I think my mom just got rid of them in the last couple of years. So it doesn't always equate, like you said, the price point, it's more about how long will it last. And even with the kind of products that you buy, how long they'll be, not necessarily trendy, but how long they'll be comfortable for you and fit your decor. Because I was reading somewhere that the average homeowner stays in their home up to seven years. So you got to make sure it's something that you can at least stand for seven years, maybe more if you're lucky. With the new project you're doing now, Calibu, because last time it was Wolf something, I remember. <laughs> Wait, we did Wolf Peak was my show house before uh, Calibu Vineyard, which is what we're on now. Okay, so how did Calibu Vineyard come about? What, how did you find the property? What spoke to you about it? And how is it going now? Well, it's actually been a, an interesting and long journey because... Calibu Vineyard is a fabrication of my own imagination. It was not originally a vineyard. And it, this was an abandoned property up in the Santa Monica Mountains that had been just sitting around for a decade. And it went on the market in 2018, which was when I was looking for my next show house. And I kept trying to buy it. It was a bank-owned property, and the bank kept telling me it was sold, but I would drive by, and it was just this abandoned property. And so I kept bugging them and bugging them. And I finally gave up because I found the property uh, where Wolf Peak was. And so I renovated Wolf Peak. We had a wonderful show house experience, had fabulous tours. It was, you know, in lots of magazines. And then the pandemic hit. And so we did principal photography for Wolf Peak on March 6th. We'd had our reveal party on March 5th. And like the next week, it was 2020 and everything shut down. And so it kind of gave me time to think and reflect. And Wolf Peak was such a wonderful experience. And I had amazing partners like Lance Plus and such, such a great experience all the way around. Um, but then this property came back on the market. And I'm sitting in my pajamas at the beginning of the pandemic. And I'm like, huh, it's back. So I started bugging the bank again, and they kept telling me it was sold. It was so weird. And finally, I just nagged them and nagged them and nagged them. And finally, they said, okay, please leave us alone. We will sell you this house. And so then uh, we sold Wolf Peak and bought Calibu Vineyard. So this is a three-and-a-half-acre property in the Santa Monica Mountains, the original home. Uh, it's it's 7,300 square feet, and the original home uh, was quite grand in its day back in the 80s when it was built by a gentleman, uh, Harvey and Marilyn Diamond, who wrote this book, Fit for Life. And I even had a copy of the book when I was a kid. It sold a million copies, no, more than a million, it sold like 12 million copies. And I'm saying, well, I bought the book, so basically I paid for part of this house. I know that I belong here. And so I, 
I, I, it had a long and interesting history. At one point, it was like a Disney property and had all this stuff, but then it fell into disrepair and just sat there. And every time I would drive by, I would just see it and say, this, I have to get my hands on this. This, this property needs me. <laughs> and so once I finally did, uh, then we took over. And the first thing we did was build the vineyard. And so we are growing 350 uh, Grenache vines, and we are making Grenache rosé and a red, and we have a wonderful winemaker. And so this will be a 19-room estate on a working vineyard. So mm -hmm. the design concept behind Calibu Vineyard is to transform it into a what I'm calling a modern Montauk-inspired retreat. And for me, that means honoring the original bones of this English Tudor home but giving it a whole different spin that is a nod to that traditionalism, but in a very contemporary way. And so we have been working our way through this project for the last year and a half, and we are nearing completion on the interior of construction. And then the exterior starts actually yesterday, the rickety destructo balcony finally got uh, permitted to be removed. So that went down yesterday. And so now the exterior remodel begins. And so we are, fingers crossed, slated for total project completion uh, around the end of August, which is when our principal photography happens with our friends at Lux Magazine. And then all of my fabulous project partners will come to celebrate with us. We have uh, our VIP party in September followed by a two-day um, open to the public design house tour. And we're going to be doing a little wine and design. So you'll come and tour Calibu Vineyard, taste our wines, see the show house. And then uh, we will take you to another uh, estate here nearby for some more wine tasting at Heaven's Hill Estate. So it's all my favorite things, wine, design, good times out in the sun. So that's what, that's what I've been cooking up this year. I know when I visited with my daughter, because that was her birthday present, was getting to go see a mansion. <laughs> and she wants to be an interior designer as well. Still wants to be one. Thankfully, she actually um, high school next year. And she put that down as her elective was interior design. So fingers crossed she gets in. And she was so impressed by the entire property. But one thing that stuck out to me that you didn't mention was how the um, vineyards are, like maybe you use the same amount as a house of four or something. Like there was some type of water system you use, which is very important in the desert considering droughts happen often there. And so on like, or just water shortages even. So share a little bit about that if you can. Well, it is actually something that I'm very proud of is Calibu Vineyard, not only as a house, but as a property, uh, highly energy efficient, water efficient. These are things that we have to think about in Southern California. In fact, uh, right now, um, our water company is in the process of cutting all the landscaping watering by 50% for everybody in the area, which will be just fine for us here at Calibu because our vines are drought tolerant. And so our entire vineyard averages about 700 gallons a week of water for the vineyard. And if the same size was uh, being watered for grass, it would take 18,000 gallons. So it is a 700 gallons is what, you know, a family of four uses in a day, just doing their laundry and brushing their teeth. So it's a very efficient uh, vineyard. It's drought tolerant. It is beautiful. Um, it's producing. We've got little grapes popping everywhere right now. And so we have, you know, we have solar here. We have a well. We have... A lot of energy conscious materials so that we could really be off the grid here and you know of course everything here this has all been remodeled so everything here is energy efficient our appliances our lighting but having the entire house powered by solar uh, means that we really aren't sucking off of any of the grid anywhere so it's it's something I am very proud of here no, that's exciting for the new homeowner, whoever they may be, because my dad lives in LA still. And it, when he was buying his house, he made a point of getting artificial turf because he was like, what's the point? They're always cutting off the rules for um, watering. And, well, and I will say one of our project partners um, here at Calibu Vineyard, our partner is Forever Lawn. And they are the highest end of luxury synthetic lawn materials. And they're creating for us this incredible spread at our backyard and the front yard, backyard of 
beautiful landscape lawn, which is called Select LX. Um, we've got a putting green. We have a bocce ball court. We've got a pet oh, run. <laughs> I mean, yeah, and, and what's wonderful is then that takes zero maintenance. Once it's installed, then we're never watering it. And so those are things that are really important here. Um, our, our lighting, our lighting is all from Lamps Plus. They brought in incredible luxury lighting here. Um, all, you know, very energy efficient lighting. Our appliances are from Monogram, uh, which Ferguson has contributed for our appliances. And we've got um, GE washer dryers. We've got Monogram appliances everywhere. They're all high efficiency. So all those things really do add up to not only money savings, but planet savings. No, and that's so important because we only get one planet. <laughs> so far, Mars is not livable. That's a joke. It's well, Mars is not really as pretty as it is here. I don't know how no. it is that you went to Mars, but it's just not uh, as beautiful as I'm sitting here right now looking out at the verdant green all around me. Uh, we do have to take care of this. So <laughs> let's mm -hmm. keep planet functioning and everybody can do their part and you know we have to have a sort of a global consciousness on that as well but it does start with the individual true and I, when you told me about that statistic with the vineyard I was just like wait what like how is that possible because I need to tell my dad about this because so, he he's an east coaster he's from um, Philadelphia originally maybe he would enjoy trying to figure that out for himself but at the same time, who wants to mow lawn if they don't have to? <laughs> so I love that you're bringing East Coast to West Coast with it being Montauk inspired. Because when I visited from growing up overseas and watching a lot of um, Dallas and Dynasty, it was like a blend of both because it had the white picket fences and there was a uh, um, fence. But then you walk in and the rooms are so grand and beautiful, like looks like um, former ballrooms and all these different things and just seeing how you're changing it to be more modern and just so beautiful and elegant it's I mean you clearly found your calling and I know you've told your story a million times about growing up with the dollhouses so and even in my past interview she mentions it so you have to go back and watch that because we're moving on to the new and what's going on now and I want to know more about with you hosting because uh like, I feel like I didn't ask a lot about that before, and you've given me so many great tips that last time that you were on. Trying to look at the camera instead of looking at your guests, so it, the person at home watching feels like you're looking at them. But I'm curious for you, when you first got started, what were some of the, or how did you first get started in TV as far as hosting? And then what were some of the pitfalls or challenges you had back then? You know, I've had a, a long and interesting journey, which I guess we all do, but I had, I went to a performing arts high school and I was still, I was actually still doing design in high school. I love design always, but I was acting as well. I went to Northwestern and I was going through the undergraduate theater program at the same time I was going through the graduate design program. And my professors kept telling me, you're going to have to pick a job at some point, lady. And I was like, well, maybe we'll see. Uh, and then I came out to California, which I am a California native. And so I came to California. And when I was first here, I was acting. Found Jennifer Farrell. And well, weekend. since you're all here, seems like a good time to tell you. Tell us what? Well, earlier this year, Tom started writing a children's book. And just for fun, he submitted it to a publisher just to see what would happen. Well, they loved the idea of the host of Kitty Corner writing an entire series of children's books, and Tom just got an advance for the first three editions. Hey! All right. Which then led me into um, producing. I ended up writing and producing, and I got. I was working in that industry very young. I was a very young producer, um, but I definitely got to the point where I just hated the job. It's a very hard job, and uh, being a producer is not for everyone. It sounds glamorous, but um, you know, I used to say that it's like a cross between being an accountant and a janitor. Because all day long, you're counting money and cleaning up people's crap. And so it really got to the point where I was like, I am not having fun. And so I, I bow down to all producers, but... No, but my dad does. He's a line producer and UPM. So I always joke that he's the CFO of films. He just yeah. does all the budgets and so on. So, yep. I, I had to sort of lay that gauntlet aside because I wasn't having fun anymore. And 
I realized I really missed designing and I wanted to go back to design. And so Jennifer Farrell Designs uh, went up in 2001. And then very, very rapidly after that, the whole home makeover arena exploded in, in television, um, which of course, that generation of it started a few years earlier with my friends, uh, Paige Davis and Doug Wilson on Trading Spaces. And they're two of my best friends. Um, but uh, a show came along called Merge that was a very, like, they had a good budget and had, you know, huge audience. It was on Lifetime. And so I was in the right place at the right time. And I became one of their on-camera talent for the show. And I was co-hosting with Lisa and Rinna for three seasons of uh, that show. And then from there, I've just sort of been working ever since. So I've had an unusual career. Yeah. Real Housewives. <laughs> okay. It wasn't Real Housewives at the time, but she's although she's been married to Harry Hamlin for a million years. Um, but I started there, and then I've I've been very lucky that I've been able to do multiple things that I love over the last twenty some odd years. I've been able to you know do my television shows and own an interior design firm, and now do products and branding and ambassadorships and so I, I have been very very lucky of how my my career has unfolded no and I love how you're all these different values because I had no idea about the acting part so because I saw like IMDB was trying to suggest um, different things. So I was like, that's probably a different Jennifer. And so now I'm going to go back and try to find those. Cause you know, everything's online now again. And yeah. again, I didn't know about you with Lisa Renna's show. And so I would love to see her in a different light. Cause I watch Beverly Housewives only because I miss LA so much. And your journey has been all over the place, but within the same vein in a way, because a lot of those things didn't exist. And as soon as they did, you were able to you had the qualities to do both or so what, what is the saying that opportunity meets the perfect timing that's luck or something like that. So you were prepared. Now, what advice would you give to someone who's interested in being a designer or even being on TV as a designer? Cause sometimes it's a little different. You have to work with things being camera ready, maybe not so much real life ready <laughs> or, and you have to work on a quick deadline. Yeah. And, and those two things are different. Um, what we're doing on television when we're designing is a different ball game than what we're doing in real life when we're designing. Um, in TV, we do have to use a lot of tricks that we would not normally use in real life. Um, tricks like, uh, okay, maybe, um, you know, I would normally put nine coats of paint on this particular item and it would be done in a factory and it would be done in a spray booth and it would have, you know, two weeks of painting and curing time. Here, we're going to get a roller and we're going to paint it and we're going to put it in the room. So it's, you know, there's definitely a different level of attention to detail because of time. It's just time on television and you don't really have time. And there are shows, of course, where they show a whole home being rebuilt in a day. And that is a really what happens I mean we you know I've worked on shows like that before where we had these million dollar budgets and we had a crew of you know 100 people coming in with sledgehammers everywhere and it still can't go as fast as it looks like on TV so there is a big difference um, but for people who are wanting to get into the television world you know we're in such a strange time now where everyone has the opportunity to put themselves on camera and put it out there I mean we're doing it as we speak and that didn't exist 20 years ago when I started in this business. And so now, if you really want to pursue a career as a, a host or as a talent, you know, as an expert, um, you have the opportunity to create content for yourself and put that content out there and to practice your craft. And so that is something that I would encourage anybody who, if you're looking for this path, that's something that you need to do even just to hone your skills, but also to get yourself out there and to really um, become, you know, make yourself exposed. But for people who are trying to get into the, just the strict design side of this business, interior design is an interesting, an interesting journey because people come to it from all different ways. Um, you know, what I love, I, Martin Lawrence Blart was talking about this not long ago about how he wasn't classically trained and 
a lot of really great designers aren't. And a lot of really great designers started in a whole different way, but it started with creativity. Um, but what I find about the best interior designers is they're all really great communicators. They know how to listen and they know what, how to sift through what people are telling them about things they love or hate. And that communication becomes something that it, you have to really listen to people and decipher what they're saying. And that I think is the best skill a great designer can have because if you can't hear what a client is really talking about, then you know, it doesn't really matter how beautiful something is that then you create, it's not fitting their needs. Um, and this is actually something I've been thinking about a lot lately. And um, I, I've been sort of trying to process the difference between design and art. And I really feel that the answer, for me at least, is that, you know, art can be uh, beautiful, ugly, or provocative for its own sake, but design has to solve a problem. Design has to meet a need. Um, if I design the most beautiful chair in the world, but you can't sit on it, then it's just art. It's not, it has no function. And design is a problem solving solution. And so I know as a designer, for me, a lot of things are um, very much about math and sleuthing and fixing the problem. Like I have a room, I need to have people sit in this room. I need to have people look out this window. How do I solve those challenges? And so for me, that's something that I think is part of that communication I'm talking about, that really understanding how do we fix the, the problems? How do we meet the challenges? That's great design. No, and I'm curious when you don't have, like with your show houses, it's you're pretty much coming up with the ideas and so on. So you don't really know what the client's lifestyle may be. Do you ever try, like, do you have like a person that you think of when you're creating your place? Like what kind of person would live here? What kind of lifestyle? What kind of entertaining they would do or how they would use each room? And especially now after the pandemic, a lot of rooms have to have multifunctions. Yeah. What do you have kind of like your avatar type person? Speaking of avatar, also your digital playground you got to play with as well as far yeah. as getting to see it virtually first and make sure it fit all the nooks and crannies and problems that may come up. Um, so yeah, can you share that? Well, that's a two part question. Um, for the first part, who do I envision in a space? Um, you know, a lot of it is envisioning myself because I, you can't really detach from what the human experience is. This is what I'm talking about with design how it can't just be art, it has to have function. And so I think as myself, if I'm in this home um, and I'm going to be cooking in this kitchen, where do I want the island to be? And where do I want the appliances to be? And what do I want to be looking at when I'm doing this? And how do I want this thing to operate? So I think a lot about myself as an avatar, but I also consider the architecture of the home itself and what kind of person is going to gravitate to that? For example, Calibu Vineyard, we're on a vineyard. It's a 7,300 square foot home. Chances are it's not gonna be purchased by a 19 year old single person who hates wine. That's not, you know, that's really not my, my audience for this particular property. So I have to think about who would live here and what would they, what would they want their lifestyle to be like? And then what are the functionality needs? like? You know, we have a home gym here because we've just been through the pandemic. And so people want to work out and they don't want to go to the gym sometimes. Um, we have a home theater that we're building here because, again, it's fun to have movie night, but maybe you don't want to go anywhere. So, you know, I try to think about what what it would look like if I lived here, but also what it would look like for the particular home itself. Who's going to be drawn here? So that's part one of the question. Um, but then for part two, let's see, what was part two? Oh, my goodness. Um, no, the virtual side of designing. Side. So what's yeah, yeah. fascinating is that we're in this amazing era where reality and fantasy can be the same thing, and you don't know which one's happening first. One of our project partners is Visualizer Plus, and they create um, this incredible 3D photorealistic 
imagery that looks exactly like what I'm going to create. And we've had a wonderful time with Lux Magazine where we've been able to reveal some of our spaces with those what look like photos before the spaces have been built. And so you can actually see our stunning Emser tile installed throughout the house before we've actually put the tile in. Uh, you can see our beautiful Mohawk hardwood floors and our fabulous Karistan rugs when they didn't exist yet. So all of these materials, like our, our kitchen has this incredible island made of a stone called Namib Fantasy, which is a soft quartzite. It's from Best Cheer Stone. And I had this vision for this 19 foot long island and this giant wrap of this stone. Well, mocking that up in the past was impossible. The Visualizer Plus, I show them the materials, I send them the images and 3D files, I give them the floor plan, I you know, tell them where I want everything. And then, you know, we have this relationship back and forth where they can literally put in my Perrin and Roe faucet from House of Roll. They can put in my Shaw's sink that has these beautiful blue leaves on it. Um, you know, they can actually put all of the materials, everything down to the gold knobs on my monogram range top. Everything is in there. And now when you look at the actual kitchen and you look at the virtual images that were done before the kitchen was created, you can't tell the difference. Today, yeah. we have lights hung in the primary bathroom. It just happened today. And I took a photo of the finished vanity wall with this gorgeous, these lights were from Lamps Plus, and we've got these beautiful um, vanities from Signature Hardware and the real little faucets and the Emser tile in the backsplash, all this gorgeous stuff. And I took a photo and I can't tell the difference between the images that we created half a year ago with Visualizer Plus. No, I remember at High Point where you were doing the PowerPoint, or not PowerPoint now, I don't know if they call it that still, but when you had the, the slideshow PowerPoint, I don't know. But um, when you were talking about the Lux spread, and I had no idea they were digital until you, like somewhere during the interview you mentioned that, I was like, wait, what? <laughs> like, Because my daughter, that's how she got interested in design was um, playing on Roblox where she redesigned our entire house, remodeled it, it like same room, same setups, and just... I was like, yeah, you're definitely my decorator from here on. <laughs> you're deciding for Christmas, everything, because she even had decorated it differently for the different holidays, and it was beautiful. So no, I love that they have an adult version of that where you can really just, even for designers who can walk their clients through different things before going through all of the maybe putting things up or ripping things out or even doing the test walls with the paints and so on. So this is really cool, exciting stuff. It, it is really amazing. And Visualizer Plus has really no rivals. They've created such beautiful, realistic things. Um, it's funny because you actually mentioned uh, changing decorations for the seasons. And what's great about using software like this is you can actually see what it would look like with this couch versus that couch, you know, because you can swap them in in the software. We're actually doing something at Calibu Vineyard with one of our project partners, um, Creative Magnetic Flooring, they do a magnetic wallpaper and I can print anything in the world on this wallpaper. And it is, they've got a couple different textures, but they've got the photo quality paper and they've got the um, wallpaper quality paper. And so what we're going to do, at, uh, we've got these beautiful nooks at, here at Calibu that we are going to create our own seasonal wallpapers because it's, it's magnetic. So the back of it, you literally can mount it on the wall. It looks like wallpaper. But then if I want to change it off for, for the holidays, I take it off and put the next one on. Or if I want a summer one, I take it off and put the next one on. I want one for my birthday. It's incredible. And so when you said changing decorations for the seasons, we can do that virtually. But there are actually ways to do that in real life, too. No, that's amazing because even I was just like thinking, ooh, Zoom backdrops. <laughs> you could change it out <laughs> to make it look like you're in your office when you're really by the pool or <laughs> whatever <laughs> you may need <laughs> in that sense. But I mean, because the vinyl ones, I don't really like those as much with um, as far as being able to just, you know, really quickly remove it because the texture sometimes is it pokes through. So this is great. I'm so excited about all the new things that are coming. And thank you so much for joining me today and sharing all about your wonderful time that you've been having at Calibu, but also about how you got started and some great tips for anybody out there who is interested in hosting or getting into the design world. So I want to make sure 
where um, make sure that everyone knows where to follow you, how they can keep up with Calibu. Because I know that every month you're showing a new area of Calibu. And so now get ready to go to May. So it's the tasting room, den and study. Oh my, at least that's what the website said. Yeah. So <laughs> like to be determined, right? So um, please let everyone know where they can keep up with this project and keep up with you. Yeah, well, absolutely. You can go to calibuvineyard.com. Uh, it's like Malibu with a C because we're halfway between Calabasas and Malibu. So go to calaboovineyard.com. You can follow on social media at Calibu Vineyard and you can follow me at Jennifer Farrell Designs. Great. Thanks again for being my guest. As always, I learn so much every time and <laughs> I'm going to have to find those old videos for sure. <laughs> I'll get the movies, Camille. <laughs> like, fingers crossed. All right. Well, have a great weekend. And thank you again for being my guest today. I really do appreciate it. And everyone out there, make sure you follow Jennifer and keep up with Calibu. And make sure you follow Camille Cower and check up on my website because this is the last week of the eSpot for season four. And I will be taking a break. And just every once in a while, I might be live or something fun like that. But otherwise... See you in season five. All right. Have a great, great, great summer. And I'll see you in Calibu. See you there, Camille. All right.